Okay, afternoon everybody. Uh, what, I'm going to, what I'm going to present to you today is, uh, is a comparative study that we are, we are conducting. So it's sort of, uh, it's sort of uh, ongoing uh, uh, work. And uh, there's, we have a few doubts and I think that the main idea is pretty much to share with the other users and maybe uh, hear from Gexcon as well uh, what they have to say about uh, the two different models that, uh, that we consider and also uh, possibly identify some, some room and we can make some improvement or, or something that uh, it's not uh, correct or misleading. So the presentation is the, the one in the initial comments that, uh, that are going to, to say just to sort of manage the expectations. Uh, I'll explain what's the geometry that we consider. Uh, the model set up for the two different approaches. Uh, some, some results of the cases considered and then some final comments. So as I just said, this is ongoing analysis. Uh, it, it might be a little bit misleading when I say that it's a comparative study because in what we call the dynamic approach for the pool model in flax, we have an option in which you have sort of the fixed uh, radius of the pool. And it might be that someone may think that that's what we call the static. So that's not what we are doing. In fact, what we're going to do is to use the, uh, the spreading of the pool, which is called uh, uh, this PM3, and we're going to compare with a set of leaks that we're going to model in the area of the pool, right? But rather than have a momentum, then that's going to be a, a defensive leak, and we're going to compare these two approaches. Obviously, at this part of the modeling, we need to come up with what is going to be the evaporation flux, and then uh, based on that, and <coughs> given a particular uh, evaporation rate, we can work out what's going to be the pool area. Uh, I'm, I'm going to explain this in more detail when we come to the model uh, setup, but just to make clear that this approach with the PM3 that we are comparing and not PM3 <coughs> with a, what we call PM1 in, in the flex uh, manual. And as I anticipated, the idea is to, to see uh, how different the approach are, uh, in which extent they are different, and uh, if how we can use one, how could you use the other one, which one is quicker, which one uh, takes longer. Uh, there's obviously much more physics considered in the dynamic approach. And then uh, we, when, when we first saw it, and based on the, 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 uh, the late, uh, latest paper uh, from Olav, and we have some of the physics that it's there, particularly the heat transfer, and obviously, uh, we expect to have a more accurate calculation of the evaporation rate. Uh, and, and we have a feeling that that might be better, but exactly that's the motivation of the, uh, the comparison. And uh, yeah, as I, as I already said, we're going, we want to extend some experience and show the sort of comparison that we did. So we have this uh, geometry that uh, we, we use, which is pretty much a whole where we kind of mimic a process plant on the top side, we have a deck here which uh, uh, separates what we call the main deck and the process deck. And the scenarios that we're going to have a look, it's a pool on, on the main deck of this uh, very large vessel. So if we have a, a, a closer look on the main deck, we use FAST, which is a code from DNV, we could use any other uh, simple tool to calculate the, as I said, the flux, the rate per unit error uh, of uh, the evaporation to work out what's going to be uh, this area, assuming that once you have a release, uh, the totality of the fuel release is going to evaporate. In other words, what we're trying to do is to say, uh, it's to approach that that releases on the boiling uh, temperature, so everything which is released is evaporated. So that's a, a closer look. So uh, it's it's very easy to see that immediately we approximate whatever it's going to be the pool by a, a square pool, which may not be the case. If you, for example, have a release, let's say here in the middle of this, uh, we, we expect uh, depending of the conditions of the slope, 
of the who, among other factors, that the pool could be a different shape. So that's one of the limitations of this approach. And uh, as anticipated, what we've done here, we sort of filled up this with loads of leaks in which we took the, uh, uh, the conditions from, from fast, from a very uh, for a simpler to, to come up with, with the several evaporation rates that every leak will represent. And then when we have all them together, they would sort of mimic the whole of the pool. So that's what we call the static uh, modeling approach. Uh, the other way that we model uh, the problem was a little bit more uh, sophisticated, if you wish, which is using the, the pool modeling flux, which pretty much relies on the shallow water equation. And in the energy balance, it, it takes to account all, uh, the, uh, the energy exchange and taking into account convection, radiation, and, and uh, conduction. Uh, I have to say that as far as I understand, and Gex could tell me if, uh, if I'm not correct, uh, if we are, if you're not specifying uh, the temperature release of the liquid of, of the fuel, then it's going to be assumed that uh, it's a it's a boiling temperature release and everything is going to be evaporating, and I think this is not going to play an important role. Uh, although this is one of the most uh, uh, important things in the model, so as we're going to discuss uh, in a few slides, that's one of the steps I had is to simulate this, consider some, some temperature in, in the release. Uh, the idea that is, is fairly simple, so <clears throat> that's what I, I mentioned by the PM3. So we specify where, where you leak in, you, you, if, you're using, if you're not using a leak file, then you, you specify here what's going to be your, your release rate, if you are, which was the case. You can set up this to zero and read the data from the, the leak file. Uh, that really depends if you have a ventilation or not to get a well-established wind fuel in your process area or the area of interest. Uh, <coughs> and again, I use the CL file, so I don't get the information from here. Then you have the leak rate considered. This particular case, 150 kilos per second. Uh, this is what they call the outer radius. I'm going to come back to this uh, in a few slides. That's one of the things that I would like to hear from Gaxman as well. We uh, for the model consider we have uh, in this area where the leak is going to be uh, 0 0.5. Uh, that, that, that was the mesh consider, so we use three times that delta x, so that's why it's 1.5. That's the coordinate of my leak location, uh, which was pretty much the center of this uh, rectangle here. Uh, I'm Brazilian, so I use the radiation from the south hemisphere. It's about 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> the water is slightly different from, from here, uh, and that's the temperature of the soil, some thickness for the plate. Um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, most of the, the setup of what we call the dynamic uh, modeling, uh, and, uh, and that goes in, into this, this solver uh, in, in the uh, run manager. So uh, this is sort of the case that we are in investigating at the moment. Uh, that might change a little bit. It depends, as I said, it's ongoing work, so we are analyzing the results, and that mm, something, so, some point might be slightly different. But what we're going to look is this first group here with 150 kilos. Uh, we have some data here, and see the cell release that goes for uh, the case in which we are using uh, those leaks uh, uh, from flux, so that's for the static modeling. So we're using 49 leaks, right, times for every leak that we have there, so that would give more or less the total evaporation rate. And in the, the dynamic modeling, we have a, a leak rate of this order of magnitude, uh, which is, at the end of the day is going to be the evaporation rate. So just having a, a closer look, so as this, we have one fixed uh, wind direction, uh, uh, essentially because we want to see what would be the effect of the, the wind uh, in the dilution, if you wish, of the fuel. Uh, these are some results from, from the static model. So <clears throat> obviously one advantage that you can't have from the other approach is, is the depth of, of the pool. So you can know more or less where your pool is going to be and what sort of the thickness. 
spool, and he is vary from uh, two millimeters to 19 millimeters. And here I have a more fraction of, uh, of the fuel released uh, on, on the center uh, point here. So we, we can pretty much see uh, the volume of fuel for the volume of, uh, by the volume of the mixture. And here, uh, what I'm doing, I'm comparing uh, the flammable, the flammable region, a sort of the flammable region. I'm not entirely sure if 500 is the upper limit, but uh, we are pretty sure that 100 is the lower limit, and we can compare the two approaches, right? So we can see here from this plot that some there's there's some gas here in the lower flammable limit, the same way that you can see in the front front of the ship, which was not observed when we use the dynamic pool, but the overall pictures uh, seems, seem, seems very similar for this particular case. Uh, so what we're going to do, let's have a, a closer look in all those six cases that we consider. But before we go to that, uh, we, would just, we want to make sure uh, that we are, we're modeling properly with the dynamic approach. So prior, prior to this, one of, the things that I, one of the things that I didn't put on this presentation is that in that paper that I made a reference here, there's some uh, validation against Burrow uh, sets of experiments. And uh, I just select one. Say, so, okay, let's see if I'm able to reproduce and how confident I am in the model. So I did that. I did that <coughs> essentially for the lower flammable limit for case number eight, which was around 400 meters. And uh, we managed to have the same same sort of results, so say, okay, it seems that I know how to use the tool, and then uh, we, we carry on modeling. Uh, there's some similar graphs on, on Flax Manual, which goes uh, for, for the different quantities which comes with the pool model. I was checking, okay, is this doing what I expect it to do? So as time goes, and we started to release at 100 seconds, just to get the well-established wind field, uh, we have the, the development of the, the mass of the pool, go to steady state, the clouds sort of uh, in steady regime, and then we switch off, and then it goes down. And then we can see here that the evaporation rate was around 150 kilos, which is in line with the fuel release. So, it, well, okay, everything which is being released is evaporating. We're sort of confident with that. And then we come up also with, uh, with the area of the, of, uh, the pool. Uh, one, one thing that I would like to call attention here is that when we, we use this approach, we have an area here which is slightly below 1,000 uh, square meters. And from these calculations here, using the number of the leaks available in uh, flux for this particular leak rate, we wind up with this area. So the areas are about 60% uh, or more uh, difference in size. So obviously that was assumption that came from a less uh, sophisticated model in order to come up with evaporation rate. So that's, that's one, one first thing that we could identify. And then what we did, uh, we, we compared for the various cases over time, the Q9, we could use the flammable cloud, could use anything else, we just, just pick up Q9, and we can see that for this case, which is the first case, we were, uh, were having pretty much the same behavior and the same cloud as time goes by. Then when the, when the wind speed starts to really kick in, right, so this case is with one meter, uh, uh, one meter per second, then things are start being slightly different. But it's interesting to observe that in terms of the maximal cloud, they are very uh, similar. But that's not the case here in which they start doing well, but at some point, they just uh, uh, split apart. But then we couldn't observe the same trend, right? So uh, as, and again, from, from, from plot to plot, the only difference is the wind speed which is getting uh, greater and greater. And then, well, they are not splitting, now they're coming back together and the cloud size is the same. And then we carry on with the analysis and sort of the same was observed. But then we decided to have a closer look with the maximal uh, cloud size for the different approach. So, and then we could observe that 
apart from some some case which was well before 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 I come to this uh, let me just clarify what I mean by this R here is essentially uh, the leak rate uh, <coughs> divided by by the airflow respecting the, uh, the respective dimension so we come up with sort of a non-dimensional leak rate so it would, would be something like equivalent to the uh, Air fuel ration or equivalent ration, something, something on these lines. So it's pretty much amount of fuel and the air that you are released in, in, in the process air. In that case, in particular, in, in the main deck area. Uh, but then for for the, for the various leak rates. So if if, if, we, if we look here, what I'm saying for a fixed uh, wind condition, I'm I'm increased the the leak rate. We have we come to a point in, in which you have a maximal cloud size, and then if starts getting too rich and then it dies off. But they are quite similar with some, with some difference as we could see from the plots. And here we try to adjust a fifth order polynomial for the two different series and we have uh, this gap. So that's, that's where we are at the moment. So obviously one, one of the things, one, one of the limitations and one thing that comes to, to, to our mind is in, in the case in which we have the static pool, because the, the nature that the leak is set up, that is very much related with the mesh, right? And then there's a, there's a limit for the upper number of leaks, which is, if I'm not wrong, 49 or 50, something on these lines. And then I come to a point that depending on the leak rate, I can't get any, any better refinement on the grid. So that's, that's one thing that we spot. So what we need to do is to go to leak rates, which are, for example, smaller than the ones that we have at the moment, that were considered in this study, to make sure that we are uh, grid independent, and then we could compare. Uh, the, way, the way it is, there's very good indication, there's, uh, there's very uh, difference in between the cases as far as the, the maximal cloud size uh, is uh, it's concerned, but it might be, uh, as I anticipated, that we need to, to have a, a, a better refinement or maybe a higher number of leaks, leak cells that we can set up in order to, to, to do a better uh, comparison. I have to say that both approaches, they take a lot, a lot of time to run, right? Uh, and uh, one of the things that we observed as well, we think that in, in a case like this, because of the surface of the pool, what's going on? That you, you are releasing the amount of fuel, but as the the wind increases, so you have a bit more of a direction. And obviously, if this is a grid cell, it's 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 not refined enough. We start losing of a bit of the physics on the the direction. So as it seems that as long as the diffusion is concerned only, it works reasonably well. But if the wind increases, then we start to have some, some differences. And at the moment, it's not clear how much of this is related, for example, uh, to the mesh. That, that, that's one, one point that we have. Another one <coughs> is, the, is the parameter that I mentioned that I would discuss later on, which was the outer radius. So there's some guideline that you need to follow that this one should be uh, greater or equal to three times, for example, the delta x. But then it comes to my mind, and that's, that's probably a question that I will drop to, to Gaxcon is, when I set up a value here, am I telling the pool that can't spread to a radius which is larger than the one that was set up? That, that's one thing. Or is there any other thing that is implicit in the model that it's, it's not clear? Well, I'll come back to this after this slide, probably. So where we are now, that seems that some uh, limitation on the refinement of the mesh, depending on the leak rate you are using, and because of the, the, the maximum number of the leak cells. So there's some sort of comparison for particular leak rates that we, we can't do properly. Uh, uh, if, we, we, if we use any kind of design of experiment or factorial approach, anything to develop response surfaces and things on this line, even if a polynomial or anything like that, then the, the good thing is that obviously the, the, in the dynamic approach, uh, you, can, uh, you can capture a, a, the transient bit. And if this plays an important role, which in most of the cases, particularly for families, will play, that, that's one good point. I mean, when you compare with the static. Uh, 
Another, another thing, there are some, some deficiencies, if I may say like that, uh, in terms of uh, how the program, how the model uh, sees where the, the floor is, right? So there are some guidelines, so the user needs to be aware of these limitations, which relies on the Z direction for the porosity. So you need to, to, to get it right, otherwise, if you have a vessel which is which has some kind of skid or something in it's floating, it might be that it doesn't place the, the, the hole in the right uh, direction. That, that's one thing. Uh, another, another problem is then if you, you try to, to look at this and you have an, another situation in, in which you have, let's say, your floor like this and you have your vessel, I don't know, like this, but for some reason, it might be that the program understands that this is this floor is somewhere here. So you have like a depression, like a, maybe a cavity or something. So it's very important that when it, the user sets up in, uh, the case is to, to keep an eye on this uh, mesh approach. That's one thing that I didn't put here, but which is important, obviously, it's the sort of mesh that you're going to have close where the, the, your pool is. So let's say the pool is going to be here. The leak is here, so the pool is sort of uh, spreading. So obviously, we're going to have, you need to have a reasonable refined mesh here to capture the mass transfer and, uh, and, the, and the heat transfer from the soil and the convection as well in order to get all the physics here uh, properly. So I should have put it here. I did what I mentioned now, so that's another thing which is important. Uh, uh, one thing that we haven't compared, and seems to me, tell me if I'm wrong, the, the great advantage is exactly the heat transfer in the model. Uh, and then if we, we take what's the storage uh, temperature and pressure, get the temperature in the release, and set up that, uh, that, that temperature in the release, and, and leave the program to the heat transfer or the calculation and see what's going to be the evaporation rate, rather than tell the program that whatever you are leaking is going to evaporate. In other words, assuming that it's a boiling uh, temperature. Having said that, it might be that, for example, when you look at uh, LNG and things like that, that's not very important in a way, because it's going to be the temperature so low that's when it's going to release. Because of the ambient temperature, then it's going to be at the boiling uh, temperature anyway. So that, that's, that's another point. Uh, Another thing which is interesting is to have uh, uh, the, the insulation uh, of, uh, of the plate, if, if you wish. Uh, in, in terms of cryogenic release, people are concerned about uh, the, the, uh, how, how the material is going to, to, to cope with the very cold release. And they may have some insulation. That's something that can be modeled. Right? And then obviously, we, that's something that we can do with the static approach. Uh, I think we talk about this a lot. As far as I understand, there's no RPT uh, in the model. I know that something uh, could be a little bit challenging or, or complex, or maybe, well, it's something definitely very, very interesting. And uh, I'm pretty sure that, that if Gex is not having a look on that, it will in the short term, maybe via a, a PhD student or a postdoc or something like that. So. Uh, that's it. That's pretty much what we would like to, to share with you. And we are, we are more than happy to, to hear from you what you think, and particularly from Gexon, if, there, if you are missing something. And um, yeah, uh, I hope maybe in the next flood meeting, we're going to have a, a more a complete picture and, and present a little bit more of the approach and this comparison. Thank you. Any doubts, comments? You have an input for the solar gain. I yeah, guess. yeah. Is that how do you kind of take a, this spills? Is this happening within the process there? You kind of take account of any shadow on it or something like that? Or mm. you know, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not really sure in the model. Maybe Gaxon can tell more if the shadow effect, for example, if you have a big 
from what I could understand, like a big vessel or a broom, right, that is put a shallow in the pole, right? That, that's what you're asking. Uh, are the process decks solid or are they? Yeah, yeah OK. For, if you take the process deck, let's assume that it's solid. It's plated, yeah. right? So obviously, there would be uh, some big shadow on, on what we call the main deck. Although at some parts, it, it may have this. And I, I don't think that is considering the model, but I think X is in a better position to say that. Yeah, because uh, from what I can say, that would be quite tricky. Because if you look from above, you may end up with something like, I don't know, depends where the time of the day, right? Then you can have something like that. This is shadow, and the sun is here. It's quite difficult to model that, I, I, I guess. Yeah. Maybe you have to have some distribution of the sun. Well, I, mean, I think at the time you have the thousand kilo, uh, the one kilowatt per square meter, then it'll probably be uh, from above. Yeah, yeah. So then I think you can assume that you don't get any like very minimal solar radiation. Yeah. But if it's here, if it's in the, the north hemisphere, let's say that's go typical point five. Yeah, we don't have any sun in north. But the, but the sun they never go <laughs> never go to the top. So yeah, but, but, so the answer is no. Yeah, that's not considered. 